Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, 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 welcome. You already know what it is. Zolo Mansions. We about to turn up. Everybody knows how I get down. I try to bring in people that expand our consciousness, that give us as a group what we've been lacking. Zolo Mansions. I have shifted the flow of Zolo Mansions. Of course, Zolo Mansions is a spinoff of the Mansions series, where I bring in a bunch of men to speak from a, 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 a predominantly male perspective, right, on, you know, what's going on in the world. Those conversations are unedited, raw conversations. And oftentimes, I am playing the moderator and mediator in those discussions. Zolo Mansions is a spinoff of those conversations where instead of me facilitating, I tend to share more of my perspective. But since COVID, you know, we couldn't gather the 10, 12 guys that we normally have for, uh, you know, a normal Mansions show. And so I, I switched it a little bit and made it Zolo where I get to talk, but I said, no, I'm gonna have to modify it even further and start bringing in people and sharing the platform with powerhouse people that can actually deliver some beneficial and useful information to our community at large. You know me, primarily, I speak on religion and culture and history, but primarily I talk about relationships. And one of the key things in relationships that I believe really handicaps us is a lack of knowledge of self. Well, I brought on a guest today that's really going to take us, you know, in a time machine, so to speak, about who we are, who we were and what we've become. But as is commonplace, you know what I gotta do first? I have to promote businesses. But before I even get to that, hit the like button, hit the share button. I always ask my people to do this because it doesn't cost you anything. Not, well, maybe a little energy to just go boop, but it doesn't cost you anything. Hit the like button, hit the share button, Let's get this conversation trending. Uh, I'm a huge respecter of my elders. I am a huge respecter of those whose shoulders I stand on. And I'm just a regular dude. But I have a very powerful platform and I wanna make sure that you guys get behind whatever my guest is working on, whatever this brother is working on, I want you in earnest to support it. Now, black owned businesses, total package energy out of the Bay Area. They have an energy drink that I drink whenever I do a show. Total package energy, here it is. Let me grab it, boom, here it is right here. It's an energy shot. They have a new version of this coming out very soon. It's 18 times more potent. It's using nanotechnology. I discovered these brothers in the Bay because my son was in the Bay training with one of the best NBA trainers in the world in terms of strength, strength training. And he was drinking this. And I said, look, man, let me promote this for you. Let me get this out there because he only had it for high-end athletes. And I said, well, is it for regular folk? He said, absolutely. But I always put a disclaimer when I say regular folk. My thing is this stuff will keep you up. And if you like sleeping, if you, if you really don't have anything to do, right? Like if you're not busy, you don't need this. This is fuel for the busy 
fuel for the active, fuel for people who got things going on. Total Package Energy, energy boost, neural enhancer, stamina sustainer, antioxidant, zero carbs, zero sugars, no jitters, amino acids, B vitamins, L-arginine. I ain't even going to tell you what L-arginine, folks. Total Package Energy, black-owned business. They also have a protein product. The protein product is unflavored, no sugar, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan. 20 grams of protein per serving. It's non-GMO. This is a one-pound bag of it. And it's vegetable protein isolate. If you're working out, like I said, you gotta be busy for their products. You gotta be doing something for their products, right? To make sense in your life. Support Total Package Energy. Go to totalpackageenergy.com. Tell them Zoe Williams sent you. Very important that we support black owned businesses. It's just that important. And I need everybody to get behind them. X Wolf is another product I'm supporting. This is the black-owned version of Nugenics. Genes, well, I'm, it's not made of the same stuff. I'm just trying to give you a picture of what it is. X-Wolf. It, too, has, what is this, a thousand milligrams of horny goat weed, maca root powder, saw palmetto berries, L-Arginine. This, this, is, this is the real deal. I've been using it. It's the real. I, I've been using all of these products. That's the best way for me to endorse these things is because I use them myself. Hit the like button when you come in. Hit the like button. Hit the share button. We're about to take off. But I have to promote these brands here. X-Wolf. All right? All you got to do is go to x Labs. Can, can I get it? X Labs Sups dot com. X Labs with an S. Labs with an S. Sups with an S dot com. With two S's. S U P P S dot com. Right? X Labs Sups dot com. Please, 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 cash mob. Please, 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 please support. Also support We Juice. It's my homeboy out of Pasadena. Naturally fresh, squeezed juices. You know, uh, he's got a nice brand. He's also a personal trainer. His name is Hassan McCullough. Go to O U I J U I C E.com, WeJuice.com. The Hurricane Report. Hopefully, you got there it is. Take action, you gotta write it, main, take action, and maintain freedom. Write it, take action, maintain freedom. This is the Al Jazeera for black folk in America, right? Alternative news source. Go to h-report.news, support, 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 support. They have all types of uh, clothes and mugs, and they use that uh, merchandise to maintain the website and to keep the writers working. So go to Hurricane Report, and now let me just say their website again, h-report.news. Go support it right now. Tell them Zoe Williams sent you. Made Main Sockery. I love Made Man Sockery. High-end socks for men, designed by a woman. Don't act like your woman don't dress you. <laughs> this is a black-owned business out of Texas. Beautiful young lady. She's also a realtor in Texas. Beautiful young lady out of Dallas. Very nice, nice high-end socks. I have several pair. I'm not wearing a pair today. Very nice, very nice material. Nice stuff. Made Man Sockery. Follow her on Instagram. There's a Made 
Man Sockery on Instagram. Go there, follow him, tell her Zoe Williams sent you. And then the final thing that I'm promoting today is Terry Lomax. Y'all know her, Terry Lomax. If you want to start a podcast, if you're an entrepreneur looking to leverage your social media and personal branding, and you want to grow your audience, you want to grow your impact of your show, you want to grow your bank account, you got to get with Terry Lomax at terrylomax.com. Mondays, 5 p.m., she has a free webcast, podcast, seminar, teaching people how to do this. Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. All these times are Pacific Standard Times. Uh, she has the same program. If you want to get into this game, a lot of people don't have the patience because you got to build your audience, you got to build your brand, you got to build your ability to be a, a great speaker. She'll show you how to do it. Terry Lomax dot Com. Now, without further ado, I want to introduce you guys to something, uh, somebody. Some people may already know who he is, but many people may not. Yes, Mike, you're on camera. <laughs> yes, you were on camera. <laughs> many people may not know who he is, but when I tell you this brother is indispensable in our community. This brother is a modern-day griot. He's a modern-day historian. Well, he's a historian, period. He, he, he is a modern-day self-knowledgeologist. We need this brother, right? And this is the type of brother who, when he comes in, I've, I've said this before, you wouldn't go into Microsoft telling Bill Gates and Balmer and all these other people who run Microsoft how to build a computer. They pretty much know it, right? So when this brother comes in, you get out the way, you make space. Brother Renoko Rashidi is a historian and research specialist based here in Los Angeles and in Paris. He is the author or editor of over 22 books. His most recent being Black in Antiquity, Beautiful, Royal, and Divine, published by Books of Africa in London in 2019. As a lecturer, Renoko has delivered presentations in 67 countries. If you don't think this conversation is valuable, especially in light of what's going on in the world today, I don't know what to tell you. As a traveler, he has visited 125 countries in the past 20 years. Renoko's major focus these days is the archiving of tens of thousands of original photos from museums from all around the world. He believes that it is impossible to reconstruct, that it is possible to reconstruct at least in large measure, measure the history of African people based on these museums' researches. Listen. The brother is amazing, and he has, he has something he wants to promote. I'm going to bring him on right now. Welcome to the show, Brother Renoko. Thank you so much for taking the time. Please talk to them about what you have coming up that they need to participate in, sir. My next big program is a webinar. It's this weekend, tomorrow and Saturday. Mm-hmm called the Global African Presence. And I'm calling it a visual masterpiece. Mm. I will take you around the world and show you the African presence in ancient times and African people, black people, in places in the world today where we typically don't expect to see them. That's the upcoming program. So how do they find it? How do they get to it? Well, the best thing is, well, you see the, um, the notice in front of you, but the best thing is just to email me, renoco at hotmail.com, and I'll send you the link, renoco at hotmail.com. It's the easiest way to uh, contact me, access me. You see the email right in front of me. There you go. Well, 
let's just jump right into it. You, you hit me with a question earlier today that was, it, it, it kind of floored me, right? And that question was, was simple. And I'm going to ask it right now. What happened to us? Just walk us through what happened to us, bruh. Because we're not who we were. So what happened to us? Well, let's talk about what we were as a prerequisite to talking about what happened to us or why we are in the situation that we are in now. When I say that, <clears throat> this is a day after the decision not to uh, prosecute the police officers in Louisville, Kentucky, in the middle of a, <clears throat> a profound struggle for racial justice, particularly as it relates to police brutality in the United States. You have this presidential election, which is madness. You have the coronavirus pandemic. So all of these things are going on at the same time, in addition to a lot of other issues as well. And so one thing, <clears throat> I think it's actually a two-part question. One is, why is knowledge of self important at this stage in history especially? That's one. And to answer your question, how do we get in the position that we are in today? Mm -hmm. First of all, let's do the prerequisite. Africa is the birthplace of humanity. That's where the first people come from. It's the parent continent. And Africa is the birthplace of civilization. And the greatest of those civilizations is the Nile Valley civilization, which is Egypt and Nubia. <clears throat> At that time, thousands and thousands of years ago, you could just about say that black people rule the world. A lot of us like to say that we come from kings and queens, and that is the best example of it. That is a kind of a high noon period for black folk. And all of this is before the transatlantic slave trade and the colonization of Africa. This is what brought us in a position where we are in now, where we are not able to even defend ourselves or we are not even respected and can feel safe in our own homes. And so <clears throat> it's a long process, but the bottom line is enslavement and colonization. Those things, unfortunately, is usually where we begin our look at African history. I say that if you begin your history with slavery, the best you will hope to be is a good slave. Hmm. So we want to go back to the very beginning. And the African proverb goes, if you know the beginning well, the ending will not trouble you. Hmm. And so it's very important to look at the beginnings. I know that's a very roundabout answer to your question, but I thought to begin with, that's how we should develop the discussion. So again, because a lot of people nowadays don't have a grandmama, don't have a big mama. Can you really go into the importance of knowledge itself? Why is it important today? We have all of these narratives happening. Uh, Democrat, Republican, Kamala, is she black? I mean, we got all these narratives happening. Feminism, uh, uh, you know, men hating women, women hating men, all of these things are happening. And I believe that a chief reason for their prevalence amongst us today is the lack of self-knowledge. Can you talk about the importance of it and what it actually meant to be aware of self? Well, you can directly measure a people's status in the world by the emphasis that they put on their history and culture. Hmm. White people, Europeans, never tire of telling you their history. <clears throat> never tire of telling you your, their story cramming down your throat. It's interesting that one of the issues in the presidential campaign is Donald Trump saying he's going to defend those Confederate statues, or even making it a serious crime, a felony, I suppose, in some parts of the country, if you deface a Confederate monument. Mm. So you can look at how people emphasize their history for those who are on top. 
while the ones at the bottom are told, for the most part, you don't have a history, or your history starts with slavery, or your history began in a remote African jungle. Malcolm X, our great black shining prince, used to say, of all our studies, it is history that is most qualified to reward our research. And I would say that you can directly measure a people's status in the world by the emphasis that they put on their history and culture. It goes like this. <clears throat> what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. Hmm. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So if you are told you ain't nothing, that you come from nothing, hmm. you will easily call a black woman the B word. If you think you don't have a history, you will shoot your brother down in the street. Knowledge itself is absolutely essential. It gives you a positive sense of self-esteem. It gives you a compass. It shapes your direction. It tells you how you see yourself and how you will allow the world to see you. I'm not saying that history is the only thing, but it's certainly a vital thing. And we can never be too busy to have a positive knowledge of self. We need to instill that in our children because you can see the powers that be, the status quo, the school system, as we know it, is not gonna do that. That's our job and that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So how do we find knowledge of self? <laughs> How do we discover it? How do we cultivate it? Where should we start? The key thing is, well, we're doing it today. And what I'll do this weekend with the webinar is show a bunch of photographs. I wish I could actually do a visual presentation right now with you on Skype with the maxim that seeing is believing and a picture is worth a thousand words. We must generate a level of excitement in our community so that people want to know what happened in the past. It's one thing to be ignorant. We can cure that. Mm -hmm. We do it every day. But it's another thing to be aware of the fact that you don't know and are comfortable with that. So one of the things we must do is we must have a different orientation about our history. For example, if you didn't know any better for African Americans, you would think our history began on a slave ship. Mm -hmm. Even the big new museum in Washington, D.C. focuses on slavery and civil rights. It's as though our history before that point is... Oh, no. Antebellum. It's all about the enslavement process. And I think that as a result of that, a lot of people get turned off by history. So we need a new orientation. If you saw the film, and I know you did, Black Panther. Yes. That, pan that movie was amazingly successful because it showed a different image of Africa. Strong, proud black people. Black women with natural hair. Right. A young sister who was a scientist. It showed what Africa could be. I think that deep down inside, all people want to be proud of themselves. All people want to feel like they came from something bigger and better than themselves. And so I think that one of the things we must do is change the orientation that we have towards our history, and that will allow us to create a level of, ex of excitement. That's right there. It just has to be tapped into. Right. So what is step one of changing the orientation? Because... I believe, and maybe you can correct me on this, I believe that uh, education as it is now is more indoctrination than it is illumination. And I think a lot of people are conditioned by Western standards, Western definitions of things. Uh, and, and my point for that is to say, how do we then break up with that conditioning? How do we divorce that conditioning? I think that that is what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. See, education just doesn't come in the classroom. Education comes from a variety of factors. And I would say that what you are doing today, and from what I gather what you have been doing, is as effective, perhaps more, more effective, than what you would get at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. I think that liberation will come from the community. It will not come from an ivory tower. It will not come from academia. Mm. We have to push it. 
Mm. We have to put it out there. Mm -hmm. the, bl the black churches need to be talking about this. Mm. The rappers need to be talking about this because that is what people listen to. Wow. So wow. it's funny that you bring that up. It's funny that you mention that because we have someone like Beyonce who's now singing about Oshun and West African belief systems. And while she's doing that and elevating it with her project, uh, Black King, you have a, a, a television show or a movie uh, like uh, the new show, Lovecraft on HBO, which is still doing that old thing where they demonize African belief systems. There's a possession scene where a priestess of Oya is there and she gets possessed and the only way that they can uh, heal this demonic house is through old Christian hymnals. <laughs> so my question is, how do we combat it? We got some people that are talking about it. How do we make it more interesting? To people? <clears throat> well, my thing is I show a lot of photographs. I mm -hmm. think visuals excite people. Yes. But I think that we also have to emphasize the positive. we don't see the immediate results that we would like to see. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Who were the first aboriginal people in the Americas? Because we have a lot of people who are making the claim that the original quote unquote so-called Indians were Africans or of African descent. Can you talk about the history of the Americas? Because I've seen on your Facebook page where you have laid it out and you show these huge Olmec heads. Can you talk about the, the, the aboriginal people of the Americas and how that story has been convoluted by Western education? Well, always keep in mind that humanity began in Africa that Africa produced the first people hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those Africans went out and filtered the rest of the world in ancient times before slavery. And some of those people, black people, because I'm essentially using the word black and African interchangeably, mm -hmm. some of them tens of thousands of years ago filtered into the Americas. We know this for one reason, because of DNA analysis, which is pretty exact now. And we also know it on the basis of what is called paleontology. In other words, we have the ancient bones. So there's no doubt that black people, people of African heritage, are the first people to settle the Americas, just like we are the first people to settle Europe, Asia, Australia, the Pacific Island. For a long time, until, in fact, until quite recently, black people were the only people. Non-black people are a relatively recent phenomenon. Hmm. Now, the problem that I have with the people who take the we are the aboriginals position is because I don't think there's a direct link between most African-Americans today and those African people who came to the Americas tens of thousands of years ago. The people, as I understand it, who push the aboriginal line seem to discount the transatlantic slave trade. And then some of these same people talk, for example, about the Olmec civilization. The Olmec civilization is important to us because it's the parent civilization of the Americas. And at the hierarchy or the pinnacle of the Olmec civilization were African people. Mm -hmm. But these are different movements. You know, history is the movements of people. And you have several waves of black people who have ended up in the Americas. You can talk about the very first series of migrations to the Americas, black people for sure. And then you have black people who come over much later on ships across the Atlantic Ocean before Columbus 
and impact classical American civilization. And then you have Africans who are captured against their will and taken to the Americas and enslaved. And even now you have African people from the continent who come to the United States as students, as business people, as diplomats. It's not one movement. It's an entire series of movements. Mm. And I think that we have to understand the nuances of that. And a lot of the folk who are pushing the aboriginal position, they're not, they're not doing that. They're lumping it all together. And they are discounting, I think, the horrors and the degradation of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And it also has an anti-African bias. So in other words, until I was in my mid-teens, if you had called me an African, if you had called me black, those were fighting words. Oh, yeah. It got to a point, if you say, I'm not African, then we might have a fight because my knowledge has changed. I'm a living example of how knowledge of self can be transformative. Mm. This is powerful. <laughs> this is powerful. What do you feel about this movement? It's a, 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 and whenever it's on TV, I know somebody behind the scenes is trying to tell a lie, especially when it comes to African culture especially when it comes to our history, which is knowledge of self. What about this pseudo archeology span and the racism behind the, te the television show, Ancient Aliens? Instead of giving the credit to the people of the continent, the Nile Valley, Kush, they would say aliens built the pyramids. They would say, and, and you see this is on TV all the time. That's their explanation that aliens built the pyramids. Alien, this was too advanced of a civilization for the commoners that were there to have built it. What is your thought about the Arabs who have taken over Egypt and now in a lot of ways trying to assume the identity of the ancient Egyptians? Your thoughts? Well, it's no different than the Europeans, the white people in America today. It would be as if they said they built the Mayan and Incan and Aztec civilization. Mm. That is pretty much the analogous relationship with the Arabs in Egypt. Mm. So a lot of us don't even know today, don't even realize that Egypt is in Africa. And even many black people seem to be surprised to hear that it was black people, that it was Africans who built the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And so again, you have different kinds of migration. We need to understand that, that people don't just stand still, people move. Mm -hmm. You could say it's part of human nature. It could be driven by a drought or climate change or famine or just an, a, an adventurous spirit, a desire to move and see and to be drawn in some cases to the wealth of other civilizations. How many wars have been started for the acquisition of wealth? for somebody's oil, for somebody's gold, et cetera, et cetera. So people move. Right. And so the Arabs who dominate Egypt today are foreigners. They are in a sense invaders. And we need to look at that and be real. But I think the bigger problem is we seem to expect people, even after this long period of interaction, to do right by us. We seem to expect them and be shocked when they don't teach us our history mm. from our perspective. Mm. Just like we are shocked and we are outraged every time there's a George Floyd and a Trayvon Martin and a Breonna Taylor. It's as though we never learn. We seem to be stunned when we are not treated right mm. by, the, by the descendants of the same people who enslaved and colonized us. So I think that African people, because we are the parent people, we expect more from our children. It's very difficult mm. for us to distance ourselves and let them go. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Humanity is born in Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago. And those Africans go all over the world. And some of those Africans went into Europe and they got caught up in that ice and they were transformed, not just physically into what we call white people or Caucasians or Europeans. Today, there's the phenotype there's a physical appearance, but there's also the psychological adaptation to being in that snow and ice for tens of thousands of years. And it created a very different mentality. Mm. Survival of the fittest, might makes right. A dog is a man 
a man's best friend, a sense of competition, a need to dominate and to control and exploit. Whereas the African who stayed in a different environment, much more laid back. Even now, I would say that most black people don't have a desire for revenge. Mm. You know, when Rodney King, the black motorist in Los Angeles, where I am now, was beaten up many years ago, when he was interviewed, the first thing he said was, can we all just get along? Wow. I think that's us. So therefore, you have to convince a black person it's important to patronize another black person. Ooh. You have to tell a brother it's important that black men be with black women. Other ethnic groups, you don't have to do that. But we love the world, and quite often the world doesn't love us back and exploits us. I don't know if y'all listening. I don't know if y'all paying attention right now, but this brother... <laughs> said, we love the world so much that it seems natural to, to have to be convinced to support our own. I, I, I really need y'all to really ruminate on that concept alone. You got to be convinced to support your own because you've lost your sense of self, which has led to there's no real desire for revenge. There's no real desire for recompense. I really need you to think about what he just said because that is the whole purpose of why I would bring someone of this stature on this show because I know that there is a knowledge gap, a knowledge of self gap or deficit in our spirit, in our being. And most of our time is spent trying to maintain the illusion that we are included in this society, right? Most people will risk it all for that little slice of the pie, not really realizing that you're wasting this divine energy, this divine personage, this self that you have inherited right now. You're kind of wasting it because if you were to discover who you are, <clears throat> if you were to discover who you are, would this be what you would choose to do? I, I, I need Brother Renoko to talk to me more about Africa, the different belief systems, uh, the Dogon. I want to give, I want to give uh, another now another example though. In addition to having to talk us into supporting black businesses. How many times have you heard, well, I just want the best the best product I can get. Yeah. You know, I don't care if it's black or not. I, you know, I went to a, a black person and it took five minutes longer for them to bring my food. And I'm never gonna do business with another black. I mean, how often do we hear that? All but the time. But even something beyond that, mm -hmm. the black capacity to forgive you know when that brother, I think his name, the brother in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yes. His mother yes. was forgiving the officers who shot him. They didn't even ask for forgiveness. You have the example of the woman or the brother in Dallas, Fort Worth, who was shot by a police officer in his apartment. Yes. And when she was convicted, yes. the family members were for, forgiving her. You know the story of Dylan Roof, a Nazi in Charleston, South Carolina, who went in the, uh, the church and shot those nine people, black people, killed them when they were on their knees at prayer. And some of the family members were forgiving him. No, they ain't asked for forgiveness now. He's shown no remorse, no contrition. And there is something unique about black people and this desire to love and forgive and to be accepted and not hurt anybody's feelings and to be nice to people even at our own expense. Mm. That is because I think deep in our psyche, we realize we are the parents of humanity. And even when our children act up, even when they attack the parent, we are still prepared to embrace and forgive. That is psychological. And that comes from an environment where we allowed black, where black people could, where people could have a good life, where women could rise to high positions. Now, when we talk about ancient Africa, 
One of the things that stands out is the power of black women. Mm -hmm. They were highly respected. In ancient Egypt, the greatest nation the world has ever seen, the line of descent was traced to the female side of the family. There were actually yes. female kings. Mm -hmm. There's never a case of rape or domestic violence in the entire thousands of years of history of Kemet. Mm. That is a part of our environment. So now we find ourselves in an alien environment mm. where we are dominated and we do crazy things like shooting each other and violence and having to convince black folk to patronize other black people, having an image of a God on your wall that doesn't look like you, a willingness to forgive anybody, a willingness to embrace anyone. And that in some ways is beautiful but at the same time, other people exploit that. And mm. we are the victims of that exploitation. Mm. 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 I just, <laughs> look, <laughs> I, I, I sit back and I, and I listen to the, to the master teacher speak right now and I'm flabbergasted because this is an everyday movement for us today. Trying to convince each other that unity is the key to our ascension. But I always say it's easier said than done. You have to undo the broken yeah. mind that you've inherited, right? You just described basically Stockholm Syndrome. The willingness to forgive our oppressor is stronger than the desire to support each other. To do yeah. business, and that's, to, that's, that's a mental illness. I need you to talk deeper into this Stockholm <laughs> Syndrome. Well, I'm not a psychiatrist, brother, but I agree it is some sort of a, it is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful on the one hand, but it leads to our destruction. Mm -hmm. You can, and you, it's not just black folk. But you can look at the stories of Native Americans, We're back to the Native Americans again. In this case, the Native Americans who welcomed the pilgrims and the conquistadors and gave them land, gave them women, gave them food, provided sustenance to them and were massacred in result. Mm. As a result, you see what happened to the indigenous people of Australia. And mm -hmm. so there's something not just about black folk, but it's something about those black people who went into the ice of Europe and turned into something else. They are running amok. Mm -hmm. And we have not figured out, even at this stage in the game, how to deal with that, how to manage that. They are running amok. <laughs> they are yeah, running I mean, what else can you call it? Right. So what are your thoughts on what Garvey tried to do with the whole go back to Africa movement. Is that still a, a, a viable solution? How would that benefit I would, us? I would say that it's more important to embrace Africa in our minds, mm -hmm. not necessarily to go back to Africa. If you want to go back to Africa, that's great. I've been to Africa more times than I can count. I love Africa, wish I was there now. Mm -hmm. But I think that we must begin to identify with Africa and believe that what happens in Africa and to Africans should matter to us. Jewish people have that relationship with Israel. They may never go to Tel Aviv. They may never go to Jerusalem, but you cannot say anything that is perceived as anti-Semitic or you are in trouble mm -hmm. because they will mm -hmm. defend their culture. They will defend Israel. Israel is a recipient of how many billions of dollars of U.S. international aid? Every year. So I'm saying that, and I don't have a problem with that. I'm saying that African people must develop that same relationship with Africa. Mm -hmm. That Africa is, even now, in spite of everything, is the wealthiest continent in the world in terms of natural resources. And mm -hmm. Africa needs us. And we need Africa, whether we know it or not. You know, we need Africa, Africa needs us. So I'm a Garveyite. So anything that gives us a kind of an African consciousness. I'm for, I'm pro-black. Mm -hmm. I'm unapologetically pro-black. I love black women. Yes. I root for Tiger Woods and Zarina Williams, even though I'm mad at them for personal reasons, right? <laughs> I still want them to win. Right. I want black people to be successful. And so I think that's natural.
Mm-hmm. And I am not apologetic about that. Now, there are even black people listening to this who would probably say, that man's a racist. Because we love our people, because we love our community. And some of us are so far gone that they see being pro-black as being anti-white. It's not. Mm-hmm. I just love mm-hmm. our people. I love the community that birthed me. Mm-hmm. I love my mother. I love my father. I love black women. I want our people to be successful. I am not against anybody, but I think that what we need more than anything else is a good dose of self-love. And knowledge of self is one of the things that can engender that. One of those, uh, there's a sister that I know, she lives in the Washington, D.C. area, a great historian. Her name is Atlantis Browder. And she likes to say, the more you love your history, the more you love yourself. Let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. The more you love your history, the more you love yourself. Marcus Garvey, since you brought him up, used to say something to the effect, if we knew more about ourselves, we'd be less inclined to disrespect ourselves. Mm. So it's all rooted in having a positive sense of self-esteem, and that comes from history. Mm. So who are the writers of history? At one point, we wrote our own history. We carved it on the walls. Who are the, the authors of history today, and who vets them out? Why should we follow what they say? Well, here's the first thing we talked about it. Never start your history with slavery. Never started with the United States. One of our great scholars and ancestor now named John Henry Clark used to say, we need to spend more time talking about where we got picked up from rather than where we got dropped off. Mm. So we want to go back to Africa. We want to go back to slavery. We want to go back to Egypt. Some of the great scholars are people like Ivan Van Sertima, Mm -hmm. who wrote a book called They Came Before Columbus. Mm -hmm. You have a man we call Dr. Ben, who was the first person to be in the year to Egypt, Mm -hmm. in Sudan. But Dr. Ben was the first one to do that. And he talked about, very importantly, the African roots of major Western religions. Mm -hmm. The African roots, and I know some people aren't going to want to hear this, the African roots of Christianity, Islam, Judaism. You have a man like Chancellor Williams, Mm -hmm. who wrote the classic work, The Destruction of Black Civilization. And more than anybody else, he addressed the issue, what happened to us? And how do we fall from the pyramids to the projects? So we have the scholars and the historians, but what we don't have in general is an orientation. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to have a much, we have to create an excitement so that people want to know. As I said, it's one thing not to know. It's another thing not to care, not to be interested. So we have to create a level of excitement and again, I salute you for the work you're doing because you sought me out yeah. to do this program. That tells me right there that you know the direction that we need to be moving in. I'm not trying to flatter myself, mm-hmm. but I think that we need to be able to support each other. Yes. And the work that you are doing makes me really proud of you, brother. I want you to hear that. Thank and you, I brother. want the audience to hear that. I'm proud of you. Thank you. And I want you to be successful. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Because I know one thing is true. Even in business, white folk teach this, even in business, you are as successful as the team you have around you. And for me, my team is my people. And I think my job, using my platform, using my voice, is to try to bring this understanding to my teammates who have forgotten we on the same team, right? Who have been conditioned to be an individual. But collectively, collectively, we are indivisible. We are indivisible. Like you can take down one, but you can't take all of us. Collectively, we are indivisible. And there's so much power in that. There's so much uh, uh, it, like meaning in that. And everybody else got a story that they authored, but our story is in the hands of somebody else, and like you said, it starts at a specific time. I always tell people, the time of slavery is a very minuscule part 
of our entire history. It's such a short time, the slavery part, 400 years, whatever you want to say, how many years, 300 years, 265 years, whatever year count you give, it's still going to be less than 500. And 500 years in the history of the African is really almost no time. If we can reconnect, and that's why I want people to read these books. The, 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 that's what I'm about to ask you now. If people who are in here now are interested in finding what books to read, they definitely should read your books. I, 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 I read your first book 20 years ago. Um, and it was, uh, I think, The African Presence in Asia. And that blew me away. So again, what books should people read? How, what, do you have a starter pack? Maybe a five book starter pack to get them going. <laughs> yeah, you can read this book right here. This is my newest book. It's called The Black Image in Antiquity, Beautiful, Royal and Divine, 200 of my best photographs. But there's a lot of books, brother. You know, one of the books that um, was so important to me and it didn't really focus so much on African history per se, but that was a book called Malcolm X Speaks. Mm. For some people, it's the autobiography of Malcolm X. I'm not saying we should ignore completely the American experience, but even if we're going to talk about the American experience, Black America, African Americans, and if we're going to talk, say, for example, about slavery or enslavement, which we must, I mean, you can't get away from it. Right. Let's not just see ourselves as victims. And I don't want to minimize the suffering of our ancestors. But let's talk about resistance to enslavement. Black people resisted. Mm -hmm. Black people fought back. And it took different forms. One form might be coming late. Unfortunately, that's kind of carried over for some of us into today. Mm -hmm. But why would you want to be early to work on Masters Plantation? Mm. Another form of resistance would be running away. You know, the Underground Railroad, yeah. where Africans escaped. Some went north and some went south. Some went into Florida. Some went into Mexico. So the Underground Railroad ran in different directions. Mm -hmm. You have insurrections. I would hope that all of us by now have heard of people like Nat Turner and Gabriel Prosser mm -hmm. and Denmark Vesey and the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. You have what are called maroon communities where well, black folk not only ran away, but established their own communities, in some cases, their own kingdoms all over the Western Hemisphere. See, that, to me, is exciting. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is inspiring. Malcolm X used to say, cotton picking don't move me. Mm. But when you talk about the African who fought to maintain their basic humanity and dignity, who tried to keep the family together, that's inspiring. I'll tell you another form of resistance. And this is something very, very painful. There's a case of one sister, she ran off from the plantation with her children, I believe from Kentucky, interestingly enough. And she got in the North, and at a certain point in time, I think 1851, you have what is called the Fugitive Slave Act. Mm -hmm. And when the, the Fugitive Slave Act said, even if you were in the Northern states, New York, Pennsylvania, et cetera, you could still be captured and taken back in the South during slavery. Mm -hmm. or into slavery. Well, there's a famous case of one particular sister who went to court, she was captured, and she was ordered to go back into slavery, and she took a knife and cut her children's throats mm. because she could not envision them returning to enslavement. So resistance took many forms. Mm. And I think oh. that this is what we need to emphasize, that black people weren't just pushovers. We weren't just victims, but we resisted all of this. And we are still struggling to continue that existence even now, because in many ways, even though the Emancipation Proclamation, even though Juneteenth, the oppression and injustices akin to slavery to black people are still in existence. We know that you have what is called Jim Crow, and you have what are called the Black Code. You have the suppression of the vote and so I don't have to tell you that the struggle against racial injustice has never ended. Mm. And we need to intensify that. And, we, and those are stories we need to know, too. 
So let me ask because you this. It's important to know we resisted. Yes, so, sir, brother. So let me ask you this. A lot of people are talking about voting and the black community, right? What are your thoughts on voting? Because you have some people who say that's the only way to change it is to participate in the system and, and, and vote uh, what your community needs, vote on what your community needs. Then you have other people that say, you've never really done a deal with our people, so we shouldn't participate in a system that's, that's going to make it seem like our vote is important, but in reality, it's not really important. What, is, what are your thoughts? Can voting and the pursuit of the change of legislation through the practice of voting, through democracy, do you think that is a viable solution for fixing some of the problems that are existing, existent in our community now? I think voting is very important. I'm not saying it's the only solution. I'm not saying it's the ultimate solution. And I definitely think that whoever we vote for, we need to hold them accountable. I don't think we always do a good job of that that you can vote somebody into office and then walk away and assume that everything is going to be okay. That's like taking your child to school and leaving them in the hands of the teacher and then you don't do anything with the assumption that the teacher is going to teach them right. So I think that we have to hold people accountable. And I think it's important to vote not only on a national level, but on a local level, you know, of um, mayors, Right. Uh, Police chiefs, district attorneys, school boards, Congress people, right. school board, all of those things. Right. I think I'm for the belief of Malcolm X when he said, by any means necessary. So I was certainly am not naive enough to think that voting is going to solve all of our problems. But I think that we should take advantage of everything that we can. We need to, in addition to that, we need to, as we pointed out, have an economic base in our community. Mm -hmm. We need to take over the educational institutions in our community. We need to uh, develop so many different, we need to work on our spiritual component. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are important. We need whatever it takes to make a strong community. Mm -hmm. But voting, I think it is very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And we can have a foot in the system and we can have a foot outside of the system. I mm -hmm. think a lot of the people who say they too woke to vote and ain't gonna vote, they're not doing too much of anything anyway. So I think we need to do as much as we can and uh, stop criticizing one another. I think we need to encourage people to do it. Mm, mm. That criticism piece is big. You know that criticism piece is a, is a monster in our community. Uh, let me ask, let me flip it in another direction because this knowledge of self thing is something that I've been in pursuit of for the majority of my adult life. So when we look at Africa, the religions of Africa, the belief systems in Africa, often have been villainized, demonized. My question to you now is, for the listeners who are listening, we're almost at 500 uh, people in here right now. Everybody say hello to Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Say hi to him. Put your, put your hand up in the chat room. Let him know that you're here. Uh, that demonization, can you please, can you please talk about the African origins of some of the beliefs that we refuse to let go of today? And when I say let go of, I mean let go of the European, the, the, the racist supremacist, their, def, their, their version of it. Christianity had an African origin. Islam had an African origin. Can you go into the origins of some of these belief systems that we refuse to let go of today? Well, let's look at Christianity. Uh, I think more black people are Christians in the United States than anything else, any other religion. So let's look at that. The basis of Christianity is rooted in Africa. I mean, all the major principles. Perhaps the most important principle in Christianity is resurrection and life after death. That you could rise again on judgment day mm. if you had been mm -hmm. righteous. That is rooted in African, in an African worldview. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you have the story of what's called the Osirian drama, where you have a man, a king, who is brought into the world to bring civilization 
He marries a woman named Isis or Aset. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a minute. But he also has a brother named Set. Set is the personification of Satan. Asara and Aset are like polar opposites, good and evil, one struggling against the other night and day. Mm -hmm. And it shows that, that, that justice ultimately prevails. Now, Set has his brother Asar, Osiris, murdered. And his wife, Aset, brings him back to life. The first person to perform a resurrection is not a white man, but it's a black woman Ooh. in the valley of the Nile in Egyptian religion. Isis, or Aset, her name, her Af African name is Aset. That means the throne. The throne. And let me say again, for those, yeah. But let me say again for those who might be coming on late, I love black women. Mm -hmm. I'm a black man who loves and reveres black women. I'm an African historian who loves to talk about the role of African women in history. That does not make me weak as a man. That shows my, my sense of security in my own masculinity. I'm not threatened by black women. I'm not threatened by any woman. So I said it's very important to us. She introduces the wedding ring. She introduces the concept of domesticity. She helps introduce agriculture. And she, once her husband had, had died, she brings him back to life. Not only that, he dies. A part of the murder is his castration. His brother actually castrates him. Mm -hmm. And in spite of that, Aset is able to grow wings and flutter over the body of her dead husband, who has been castrated, and conceive a child. This is the first time we hear of a virgin birth in immaculate conception. They produce a child called Haru, mm -hmm. which is very similar to the infant Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Haru's mission is to avenge his father's murder and to reclaim his legacy. So you have the principal story of Joseph and Mary and the infant Jesus and the resurrected Savior and the immaculate conception. In addition to that, you have in Kemet what are called the admonitions of Ma'at. Ma'at is a personification of truth, justice, righteousness, balance, order, harmony, reciprocity. She is the moral law of the universe, mm -hmm. portrayed in the form of a black woman with a feather, an ostrich feather on top of her head. Mm -hmm. Now, the admonitions of Ma'at go, I have not stolen. I have not committed adultery. I have not, a, this is the basis ten of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah. So all of these things come out of Africa. The problem is we have been taught to look at Africa in such a negative light to the point that many of us don't want to have anything to do with Africa. We still think of Africa as the jungle mm -hmm. where Tarzan and King Kong hang out. And that <laughs> is why we must change our perception of Africa. Because once you start to feel good about Africa, the rest falls into place. You can't hate the roots of the tree without hating the fruits of the tree. Mm -hmm. What it what are some of the African origins of Islam? Well, for example, we know that you have parts of the soul and the spirit in Nile Valley uh, eschatology, I guess you could call it, is the Ka and, and the, the ba. ba. Yes. And so you have in Mecca the Kaaba sanctuary, which is, I suppose, the most venerated aspect or the most venerated uh, object in Islam. Mm -hmm. And you could go to all of them if you wanted to go to the Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. You can have African roots because remember, Africa is the birthplace. Africa is the birthplace and Egypt was the mouthpiece. And from there, all these ideas, all these concepts flow to the rest of the world in so many different ways. You had this fuss a couple months ago when 45 went to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Mount Rushmore is based on a series of statues in the Nile Valley of a, a temple called Abu Simbel, where you have four images of the African king Ramses the Great. And here you have four presidents. If you look at the Academy Award, the Oscar is built on the likeness of an African deity named Pata. Mm. If you go to Washington, D.C., and see how it's laid out, you see the Washington Monument and the reflection pool. That is based on Egypt because the founding fathers of the Americas, mostly slave owners, were also Masons and Rosicrucians. And the Masons and Rosicrucians understood the importance of ancient Egypt. Mm. So you can't get away from Africa. 
We just have to begin to change our orientation for it. We have to begin to develop a knowledge of self, a desire for a knowledge of self. And when you do that, everything falls into place. You must learn to love your roots. And if you learn to love your roots, the rest will fall into place. Of that, I'm convinced. Yes, but isn't it genius? Isn't it genius? People think slavery is just uh, getting beat and being forced to work under the threat of violence. But there's a psychological violence. There's a genius. There's a maniacal genius behind it that says, I'm going to villainize all the things about this people that I covet, that I wish I had, that I wish was me. There, there, there's civilizations. There, the culture, the religion, the belief system. I'm going to make the belief systems evil, but I'm going to remix them and do my own version of them. And then I'm going to make them follow that. It, it's, it's maniacal the way that they've flipped it. They've taken... But isn't, isn't it like that with everything? Oh, yes. Let's look at the history of rock and roll. Cool. Now, many people would say that Elvis Presley stole his mojo from Chuck Berry. Yes. And people were not willing to embrace Chuck, but you could take a European and give and do the same things and you'd be very comfortable with it. That's where racism comes in. Mm. That's where white nationalism shows its ugly head because people want Africa, but they don't want to call it African. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and it's still happening today. The it's still engine, happening today. The fuel for the entertainment in industry, the music industry, is typically okay. Michael Jackson, Prince, Whitney Houston. But the people that control the apparatus, the people that dole out the money, <laughs> are not us. But we're the fuel for it. Why? Why do you think, after all this time, it's 2020, we're still in a position of turning over on our brother for a better deal from our oppressor? Brother, I'm not a psychiatrist, man. <laughs> I could only begin to guess, but we see it in so many ways. Now, right now in the background, I'm watching the. I have to confess. <laughs> I'm in LA. I'm a big fan of LeBron James. I'm watching the basketball game. Okay. Most of the athletes in the NBA and the NFL are black, mm -hmm. the most skilled ones. And yet, how many black owners are there? In the in the NFL in particular, there's pressure on these brothers not even to kneel when the national anthem is played. Mm. And yet, black people are the majority, and everybody says, go, go, go. They love us as long as we stay in our place. Mm. It's only when you step out of your place that you become a threat. But as long as you are a good boy and a good girl, they'll give you a pat on the head and say, and go for it and give you a little money. My goodness. So the question I guess becomes is, mm -hmm. is that the result of enslavement? And Colin, mm -hmm. talk without feeling like you have to have the last word and you have to be right. Mm -hmm. I know we all have an ego. Everything else has been taken away from us, basically, but our ego. But sometimes just the ability to listen with patience and tolerance and love and respect and just talk to each other. I think that that will go a long way towards healing because we are badly wounded people and hurt people hurt people. Wow. And whether we realize it or not, we are deeply hurt. Mm. The, the damage, the horrors of enslavement are still in our psyche. Do you know? that in one of the dungeons in West Africa, a place called Gori Island, they had a dungeon, talking about slave dungeon, they had a dungeon for children. Now I want you to think about that for mm. a moment, where African people are captured deep in the interior and marched to the coast. Most of the Africans who died as a result of enslavement died in Africa from the time they were captured and then taken to the dungeons. And the dungeons themselves were horrible places. The women's dungeon, do we even have to think about what happened mm. to our sisters in those dungeons? And I think that that is a painful thing that black men could not intervene and save them. But there was also a dungeon for children. I've been in it, I've seen it. You don't have to tell me, I know. Now imagine your wife, your mother, your father, your daughter is in that dungeon. Mm -hmm. And you can hear your daughter yelling, shouting, daddy, 
I'm scared, Daddy. Come get me. I'm hungry. I'm afraid this man is hurting me. And this were to go on for hundreds of years. And so think of the psychological damage. And then you were put on the ships. You were branded with hot irons like an animal. And put on the ship, hundreds of African people at a time. No toilets, no electricity, no air conditioning. Layers of layers of African people. Imagine the stench and the blood and the urine mm. of the rats. And this went on for weeks on a rocking ocean. And then you get to the Americas in the horrors. So we are still dealing with that because we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's such a painful subject. We would prefer to push it in the back of our minds, but we have to come to grips with that. Mm. We have to be able to sit and talk to each other and heal, and nobody's going to do that but us. So speaking of the dialogue that you're talking about, um, we've had uh, a lot of great men throughout our history here in America, black men that have stood up and, and tried to you know, have this conversation with white America. What about us as a people? How do we develop a rapprochement with Africa and those in the African elite that participated in the slave trade? Are there some African families that owe us as much reparations as say some white people who owe us reparations? Do you think we should have that conversation with the continent and those who participated in the slave trade on their end. Yeah, we should. Mm -hmm. We should have a lot of conversations and one is not exclusive to the other. Mm -hmm. Black people should be talking to white people. Mm -hmm. Black men should be talking to other black men about what are our responsibilities as men, as fathers. Mm -hmm. Black men and black women need to sit and talk to each other. We know that. Mm -hmm. We need to have conversations with our children. And certainly we need to have conversations with sisters and brothers beyond the water. Yeah. Because I think that there's a lot of misunderstandings on both sides. Now I've lectured in, I think, 67 countries now. And I remember my first trip to Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. I was asked to do a presentation for the history department at one of the major universities there. And of course, I was delighted to do it. Mm -hmm. So I do the presentation and there were about 40 all men, for whatever reason, Ethiopian uh, history students and the uh, head of the department was there. And I had about 45 people from my African-American tour group. So after I do the presentation, I asked people, I said, um, now who has a question for Dr. Rashidi? And nobody says anything. And I said, you mean to tell me I'm going to come all the way over here, audience, whoever the audience is, what do you think of when you think of Africa? And I get three on your freedom, and now we want to know why you turned your back on Africa. Wow. The atmosphere, wow. my brother, was electric because now everybody's talking. Mm. And so I asked the members of my tour group, how do you respond to that? Everybody's hand went up. One person says, You all think that the fact that we are here makes us rich, and you're always asking us for something. I must say, begging is rife in Ethiopia, mm. and that wears you out. And then another person said, well, what if I were to give something? How do I know you would use that for the liberation of Africa? And the third answer was the big one. One person says, I don't owe Africa anything because your ancestors sold my ancestors into slavery. You could hear a pin drop, brother, mm. because these are the kinds of conversations that we need to have instead of misconceptions and misperceptions and ignorance, we just need to be able to sit and talk and listen to each other. And I cannot put enough emphasis on that on every level. Mm, mm, mm. Conversations have to be ongoing. And I love public conversations, but I also believe some of these conversations should be behind closed doors. I don't think everything that we think should be out on YouTube. Your thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, well, we have to operate on many levels. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know if you can plot and plan a revolution on Facebook. No, I don't think you so. Know? <laughs> we just sometimes need to have face-to-face. -face. You know, <laughs> even sometimes talking on the telephone is not what it used to be, but the bottom line is communication. Right. Communication, conversation, open-mindedness, leave your ego at the door, and sometimes just be willing to listen. That's what women have told me all my life. Mm. I've been in a lot of relationships. I could write a book about that. 
and not all of it good. And what <laughs> sisters have always said, Renoko, the most important thing is we have to be able to talk to each other. Talk to each other, baby. Mm. Listen to me, mm-hmm. and I'll listen to you. I think that you can't state that enough. Man. So let me do this before we, we wrap it up. One, I, one thing I want you to do right now is to promote your webinar and all of your books, because I really need everybody to just go find his books, because a lot of people are saying they're out of print and all kind of stuff, and book costs $600. I need everybody to cash app or, or just cash mob this brother, buy his works, buy his books, sign up for his uh, webinar. Where can they find you? How do they connect with you? How do they lock in with Dr. Renoko Rashidi? Well, that's very easy. Renoco at hotmail.com. Renoco at hotmail.com. R U N O K O at hotmail.com. Go to the website, mm-hmm. drrenoco.com. Drrenoco.com. The webinar is Friday evening and Saturday morning. It's two parts. It's called The Global African Presence, a Visual Masterpiece. Mm. It will be a virtual presentation on Zoom. And I will show about 300 of my very best original photographs from around the world. It's not to be missed. There's a small fee, and that is used to help finance my research. Scholars have bills to pay, too. My books can be found on the website, drrenoco.com. I have about eight books that are in print. Mm -hmm. I have a book on the African presence in Asia, a book on the African presence in early Europe. I have two photo books. I have an uh, autobiography a travel book, a book for children. And so we can say in many ways that ignorance is a choice, that there's a lot of information out there and we just have to dig it up. There's an African proverb that goes, until the lion has a historian, the hunter will always be a hero. We should have to wait for other people to write our history and tell our story. Mm-hmm. We have to be willing to dig and we have to be willing to support the conscious artists, scholars, activists that are out there on the front lines. Everybody can't do everything, but Mm. everybody can do something. And we need your support. We need to get involved. We can do this. We have to have the belief that we are the ones that we've been waiting for, that nobody's going to save us, and that we have to make African empowerment a priority. It -hmm. can't just be when we feel like it or when it's convenient or when we get an extra minute or when we have some time. It has to be a priority that our fate that our destiny is in our hands, and we can do this thing. Well, brother, let me just say, I took a chance. I have been following you on Facebook for years. I took a chance. I saw your number. I said, let me call this brother and see if he will do the show. And I'm so glad and happy and appreciative that I did because, like I said, I've been a fan of your work. It has molded my mind and my perspective I just thank you for taking the time, especially during LeBron time, (laughs) to share with us, brother. (laughs) To share with us, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so, so, so much, brother. Thank you, brother. Have a good evening now. All right, you too. So let me just say, (sighs) that brother is 66 years old. I'm still in my 40s. And let me just say, I'm tired. So I can only imagine how tired that brother is. I can only imagine how tired, say, the minister is. Let me point something out to each and every one of you really quickly. All of us are flawed. All of us are jacked up. All of us have been through hell and high water. All of us got problems. All of us are a work in progress. All of us got issues. All of us are are janky in some way. But all of us have gifts. All of us have something to offer to one another. That brother offered something very, very powerful, and I'm urging everybody that's in here to sign up, right? Sign up 
get that information from that brother. Because like he said, at this stage of the game, ignorance is a choice, right? Here we are right now, live on my show. The brother brought up something that was amazing to me. You got to be convinced to roll with your own. And we talked about that Stockholm syndrome. That's Stockholm syndrome, man. You got to be convinced to roll with your own or you have, to, you have to be guaranteed some type of benefit. Come on, man. Come on. That's like people asking me, you know, how do I monetize my video? Well, it takes a while. You got to build your audience. Right? You gotta, it takes a while to build your audience. It takes a while to build your platform. No, 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 no. I want to get paid to do it. Well, who are you to get paid right now? Where's the uniqueness in your voice? What unique concept do you have? Do you have any experience on creating this and then maintaining it? Everybody wants something right now but nobody wants to invest in something that's going to accrue value over time. Starting a podcast is like that. You don't start a podcast unless you're already a, a super celebrity. You don't start a podcast with a million followers, with 30 followers, with 100, with 10,000 followers. You don't start right there. You develop it. You grind, you stay consistent, right? If you say you're gonna come on at eight, you come on at eight. If the show's an hour, it's an hour, right? You gotta do the work. So when it comes to knowledge yourself, guess what you gotta do? You gotta do the work. Self-work, self-knowledge is about developing the truth of you. It's about becoming the author of one's self. If your identity is predicated on your check that you get from your boss, then your identity is in the hands of your boss. Take away your boss and your check, where's your identity? It's like a divorce. You're like a 60, uh, a 10 year old whose parents just divorced. You don't know who you are anymore. You, your, 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 your sense of self is fractured. That's what happens in divorce, right? If your sense of self is in your wallet, all we gotta do is take away the money. And then you're self, this is why people commit suicide. I'm telling you, man, everybody's a critic. Everybody's a put down artist. But nobody really wants to invest and put the time in to heal the community. I brought that brother on because I know what he is. I know what he, did, what he is and what he does. You understand? That's why I brought him on. Go, 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 go find him. Go do your research. Vet him out. See what he's about. You don't have to agree with everything everybody says, but Putting the time to discover what people are saying makes you knowledgeable in different areas. Listen to folk, right? I don't agree with everything everybody says, but guess what? I'm respectful enough to listen objectively and then take away what I can use and leave what I can't. How long is it going to take you to turn around? How long is it gonna take you to get out of the spiritual bed and wake up and start doing the work? That man talked about us suffering from PTSD because of all of the things we've been through in this society. Well, guess what? I've said it a million times. There is no way we gonna get right with each other when we prefer to forgive our oppressors because there's an opportunity or, an, or a benefit that comes from doing that. Well, let me stay in good graces with boss because boss signs checks and boss presents opportunities. We, we are more inclined to forgive our oppressor than we are to forgive our baby mama, than we are to forgive our ex, 
We're more inclined to do that. We can't even be human. I've said it a thousand times. You can't even be human with black folk. What do you mean, Zoe? To error is human. In other words, you don't make mistakes if you're a work in progress. We make mistakes against each other all the time, but there's no incentive to forgive each other. There's no incentive to forgive each other. There's no opportunity coming from me. So you, don't, you can ghost me. You can not talk to me, right? There's a sense of empowerment there. You feel that, you know, fuck him. But you don't do that to your oppressor. Hmm? In some relationships, it happens that way. How many times you seen a motherfucker keep going back to a person that abused him? Over and over and over again. And when I say abuse, I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about emotional, psychological, right? You know this person doesn't appreciate you. You know this person doesn't really care about you. You know this person ain't really invested in you like that. But you keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back. Come on, man. We live it, somebody just said it right there. You can't show love for a sister that was wrongfully killed by the cops without another brother calling you a simp. You can't say Whoopi Goldberg, young Whoopi Goldberg was beautiful. You know how many dudes call me simp? And, and listen, this is not me talking shit about my brother Corey. I'm not. That's me and Corey's shtick. I'm talking about the brothers who watch the shows, right? Who watch our shows, his and mine, right? Brothers watch our shows and be on Zoe like, oh, Zoe the type of dude that a simp. Let me tell you something. Colorism made it easy for me. I get the women you can't. Based on colorism. I, I just want to keep it a hundred. I have to work less than you because according to beauty standards, I have been considered more attractive than most dudes. Based on superficial, oh, he's got green eyes. Oh, he's 6'2". Right? Yeah, yeah. It's been easy. Do, do you understand? That's nothing to be proud of. That's nothing to be proud of. So you got dudes running around, Twitter keyboardists, keyboard gangsters. <laughs> recognized substance meaning is the real matter and I tell you something else if you lack integrity if you lack follow through if you can't stand on what you say you're gonna do they leave now watch this here's the flip side if you got substance they'll still leave you know why because substance in a person, whether it's a woman or a man, will come out to the partner and also cause them to be responsible for something. When you got a substantive woman, she gonna make you know like, oh well, I can't bullshit no more. And a lot of times when you're dealing with a man that ain't fully developed, that ain't fully grown, he going to shirk from that energy coming from her that's calling him to, to reach his full potential in the relationship. Suffering from PTSD. Sitting here picking and choosing who we like based off what they look like. Man, I brought that brother here. I hope you guys support that brother. I hope you guys support me. 
uh, my master class is still available right now. I'm asking that if you haven't signed up for it, you should, right? If you haven't signed up for the master class, sign up right now. ZoeWhatMasterclass.com. It's five and a half hours of a relationship intensive. It has worksheets, printable, downloadable worksheets. It has videos. It has a curriculum built into it based off of the books that I have available. The Holographic Relationship and the Relationship Dismount, as well as 2021's The Shrouded Lighthouse. We want to work together. We got to break up with the psychological definitions and chains that were put on our mind by this most sick society. You want to know more about Renoko Rashidi? Go to his website. Go to his website, sign up for his seminar. Support the brother in earnest, right? For all those who hit the super chat button and the like button and the share button, for everybody that hit my cash app, I appreciate it because we need it like a mug. If, if everybody in here could send a brother $5 right now, I'd appreciate it. Dollar sign, so what, netter? Also, I ask you, Oh, the Cash App is on the screen. There it is. Okay. Also, I ask you and I urge you to support Sarah without the H. She's in here right now. Please hit her Cash App. Like I said, uh, a lot of times, man, we can't get this show done unless Sarah is here, right? So please support Sarah. Dollar sign Sundays with Sarah, and that's Sarah without the H. We thank everybody uh, for being here. We thank everybody for kind of toggling back and forth between other platforms and, and, and the Laker game and all of that. Thank you so, so much. But we got to go. We appreciate you all. Deuces.